So you're a scholar of national populism as well. And some of the things we've spoken about today with regards to institutional drift towards the cultural left, it's clearly something that irks most people who would be categorized as populists, whether it's in the UK, the US or across Europe, where they look at their institutions and say, you've moved away from sense and I don't really recognize this within my country or the reality that it is that you're, you're putting toward me. Um, do you, uh, and I suppose on top of that, we're, we, we're seeing mass immigration, particularly in the UK, which has become a huge salient point, which is what's, what's going on with our demographics and people feeling under threat in some way. Um, putting all of these things together and including that Gen Z potential uh, divergence when they get older is do the populists ever cut through? Uh, what does it? What does it? What does it look like? Do you, Do you think cultural left here to stay, or does that pendulum swing back at some point? Well, we have the. I think there's two in political science. There's these two ideas. There's the attitudes. So your your attitude to immigration. Let's say, do you want should immigration rise, stay the same, or be reduced, reduced a lot? That that would be an attitude question. The second is the what we call salience, which is what priority, where do you place immigration as an issue? What's the most important issue facing your country, you know, facing Britain? You know, there's the economy and there's healthcare and there's you know, environment, foreign policy, all kinds of things. There's immigration as well. There's culture wars, whatever. Um, and what's been happening, what was happening prior to the Brexit vote and what's happening again is that immigration is rising up that priority list. When immigration rises, that's when populism, national populist parties start to do well. That's been the pattern. Uh, and so um, what's happening now is because of increasing levels of immigration, the salience of immigration is rising. Someone who said, yeah, I want less immigration, but immigration is my number five issue after healthcare and the economy and the pandemic. Now, oh, no, immigration is my number one issue. Now, that mm -hmm. suddenly that voter is biddable for a populist movement. Uh, that's what's been happening. Um, now, where this intersects with woke and the culture war. So culture war issues generally, if we take Britain, have a much lower profile for voters. They don't pay that much attention. They don't understand that well. I mean, they do understand something like, has political correctness gone too far? 80% will say yes. I don't feel as free to say my views about immigration and trans. You know, 50, 60% will say yes. But in terms of, if you ask, you know, what's the most important problem facing Britain, that'll rank pretty low. Um, however, the, the issue is that those, that issue is connected to, for example, immigration and crime and homelessness and education. It's connected to all those issues because woke shuts down conversations. It narrows what you're allowed to talk about. So if you're not allowed to talk about immigration being reduced to 100,000 a year, let's say, uh, because you're going to be accused of being a racist, that's woke in operation. So woke downstream effects, the second order effects of woke are to increase immigration, to make it harder to control the southern border in the U.S. because you don't want to be deporting anyone or uh, cutting out their asylum claim or making them remain in Mexico because you'll be accused by the left wing of your party, if you're Joe Biden, uh, of being a racist or of, of not being, you know, upholding social justice. So, so essentially woke is interconnected to all of these other issues, but most voters don't understand that. Now, one of the things that remains to be seen is whether a politician can come onto the scene to try and shed light and make that connection more strongly and say, if you care about immigration and you care about reducing crime and education outcomes in schools, you have to care about critical race and gender ideology in schools. You have to care about what's happening in the civil service with DEI that is the reason that we can't pursue these policies. Now, that's going to take a couple, you know, the right political communicator to actually make that link. But the link, I think, will eventually be made just the way the link between, let's say, being a member of the European Union and wanting to control immigration. People in Britain eventually started to make a link between, oh, in order to get control of our border, we need to leave the EU. Likewise, it could eventually become the case that people will say, oh, in order to control immigration, we're going to have to control and deal with woke and EDI and critical race and all these other things if we want to. Or, or 
in order to be able to stop and search, in order to be able to isolate, you know, badly behaved kids in school who may, may be disproportionately, let's say, of a certain race, you know, in order to actually improve it, the outcomes for that race, actually, because they're the ones that are damaged by these people acting up in class. All of those things are going to have to be connected more effectively by politicians in order to raise the salience of culture wars issues. So we're grappling with when are we seeing the taboo break? And it's only once that taboo breaks that the dam bursts and progress can be made on all of these other issues of salience and people's attitudes feel like they're being listened to. Well, yeah, so the, the, the taboo is really at the heart. You know, that was the big bang that created our moral order. It's the center, the sun around which our moral order revolves. I mean, we, we need a norm against racism as against sexism and transphobia and other mm. things, but it needs to be more like jurisprudence and the law where there's proportionality, proportional punishment, not sudden death. There's a second chance. There's, you know, learning from your mistakes. There's a whole bunch of things which the law recognizes. It's just much more subtle, whereas taboos are just, oh, we, we need to sort of super plug into your disgust reflex and you cross the line and you're canceled. And that's the way taboos work. And and maybe that's fine for urinating at the table, but it's not fine for, you know, what's that? <laughs> it's not fine for something as subtle and as kind of protein as, as, as racism where, okay, it's one thing if it's, easily you know if it's calling somebody the n-word to their face that's one thing but wanting to reduce immigration uh you know wanting to have a stop and search policy wanting to exclude badly behaved people i mean once you if you don't have a bound around this thing uh and i don't think you can have a taboo and have a boundary because by definition it's a sacred value uh mm -hmm. and it's that fixation and that sacralization which is really the problem and we we're until we unpick that I don't think we're fully going to get out of the woods.